Questions to the Prime Minister. Mr John Barron. Number one. Yeah. The, yeah. the Prime Minister. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I'm sure the whole House will want to join me in expressing our deepest shock and sadness at the news of the air crash in Ethiopia on Sunday. Our thoughts and prayers are with the families of all 157 that were on board, including the British nationals who were amongst the casualties. I've sent a personal message of sympathy to Prime Minister Abbey and extended an offer of UK assistance. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues, including my right honourable friend, the International Development Secretary, who very helpfully offered to teach me sign language. <laughs> In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Uh, Mr. John Barron. I'm sure all of us concur with the Prime Minister's remarks about the disaster in Ethiopia, and many of us recognise the Prime Minister's efforts to secure a deal. But given that we profitably trade with the majority of the world's GDP outside the EU on largely WTO no deal terms, has the time not come to look beyond this Westminster, this, this Remain dominated yeah. Westminster bubble? Yeah. And for all of us to recognise that the default, default position of our votes to trigger Article 50 is that no deal is better than a, than a bad deal, so that we can honour the referendum and leave the EU on the 29th of March. Prime Minister. Mr. Speak, Mr Speaker, it may be to the benefit of the House, and I'm sure people will uh, recognise if I try and keep my answers shorter than usual today, can I say to my honourable friend, I want to leave the European Union with a good deal. I believe we have a good deal. Yes, no deal is better than a bad deal, but I want to have been working for us to leave on the 29th of March and leave with a good deal. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you, Mr Speaker. I absolutely concur with the Prime Minister's remarks about the disaster of the air crash in Ethiopia and indeed the earlier crash in Asia that affected the same aircraft. And could I also at this point commend the Civil Aviation Authority and the European Union for taking prompt action about the safety of the aircraft concerned. We need to ensure that all air passengers are as safe as they possibly can be. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has been stubbornly declaring that the only choice, between her, the only choice is between her deal and no deal. Last night's vote finished off her deal. Tonight, she's not even showing the leadership to whip on no deal. Just a few weeks ago, the Prime Minister whipped her MPs against ruling out no deal. So how will she be voting tonight? Yeah. Prime Minister! I'll be voting for the motion standing in my name. <laughs> Mr Speaker, there may, there may well be other votes, and her Brexit strategy is clearly in tatters. Her deal has been twice rejected and is now dead, and she's not even asking her MPs to support her on it tonight. A couple of months ago, the Chancellor, who is here today, we'll hear from him later, reassured business leaders that the threat of a no-deal Brexit would be taken off the table, while the Business Secretary said a no-deal Brexit would be ruinous to the UK economy. Indeed, the Government's own forecast suggests that no deal would knock 10% off the economy, damaging jobs and industry. Why is the Prime Minister still ambivalent about the outcome? Prime Minister. I say to the right honourable gentleman, I have been working for leaving the EU with a deal. Businesses and business organisations have been clear across the UK that they want MPs to back the deal. Yes, businesses worry about the uncertainty of Brexit, but there's one thing they worry about more, and that's a Corbyn government. Yeah. Yeah. Corbyn. Well, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister doesn't seem to understand. Her deal has been flatly rejected twice by this House by unprecedented majorities. And even this morning, the CBI has said that no deal would be, and I quote, a sledgehammer to the economy. And, and, and went on to say there has been no consultation with business, adding this is no way to run a country. The reason her deal is now dead is because at every step of the way, the Prime Minister has refused to listen. 
refused to listen to manufacturers, refused to listen to trade unions about the best way to reject jobs in this country, which is to agree a customs union. Manufacturing is now in recession. Many companies have laid off many workers. Her own deal has been decisively rejected. When will she listen to those workers who are concerned about their jobs, those businesses are concerned about their future, and accept the case there has to be a negotiated customs union with the EU? Prime Minister. When it comes to the CBI, the CBI said that the Labour government's policies would lead to a drop in living standards. That's not very good for the people he claims to stand up and represent. But he talks about he talks about a customs union, which of course was part of proposals that he put forward. But it's yet another position that he's taken. He's moved to being in favour of a second referendum. But I note that last night he didn't actually refer to a second referendum. He's just spoken about a deal about a customs union that's already been rejected, yeah. and actually, in the past, very often rejected by him. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, it would be rather reckless to rule out any option at the present time for the Prime Minister, I would have thought. I don't think her answer will help workers at Honda in Swindon or those in Nissan in Sunderland or many others that are very concerned about their future because of the danger to manufacturing industry. Mr Speaker, Britain's food producers are also in despair. A coalition of UK food producers asked the Prime Minister to call for tariff-free access to the single market. With her red lines now in tatters, will she now back the view of UK food producers and back close alignment to the single market to secure their industry? After all, she promised at Chequers there would be frictionless trade. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman that the deal that we have negotiated includes access to the European Union on the basis of no tariffs? Might help if you'd actually read it. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, it was um, a former DEFRA secretary, the member for North Shropshire, who was campaigning to leave in the referendum and actually said during that, and I quote, because it's not the kind of language I would use, only a madman would actually leave the single market. The Prime Minister has previously said you can't just reject no deal, you need to be for something. So with her own deal now so decisively rejected, can we be informed by the Prime Minister, what is she now for? Does she now recognise the Labour alternative, the five pillars we put forward, is the credible show in town available and ready to be negotiated? Isn't it time she moved on from her red lines and faced the reality of the situation she has got herself, her party, this Parliament and this country into? Prime Minister. The gentleman talks about not wanting no deal, yet repeatedly votes in a way that brings no deal closer. I, can I say to the right honourable gentleman, the deal that he's proposing actually has been rejected several times by this House. I may, I may not have my own voice, but I do understand the voice of the country. They want. The House must calm itself. I want to hear what the Prime Minister has to say and what everybody has to say, and it should not be necessary for voices to be raised for a member to be heard. The Prime Minister. And that is, people want to leave the EU, they want to end free movement, they want to have our own trade policy, they want to ensure laws are made in this country and judged in our courts. That's what the deal delivers, that's what I continue to work to deliver. He used to believe that too. Why is he just trying to frustrate it? Jeremy Corbyn. Speaker, I do have sympathy with the Prime Minister's voice and I hope it soon recovers. I understand how painful this is. The Prime Minister... The Prime Minister's deal has failed. She no longer has the ability to lead. This is a rudderless government in the face of a huge national crisis. The Honourable Member for Broxbourne recognises it, saying, and I quote, the government is not fit for purpose, we're not doing what we need to do, which is govern the country properly and effectively. Where the Prime Minister has so obviously failed, this House needs to listen to the country. Listen 
to unions, listen to people in work fearful for their future, manufacturers and businesses, workers and European Union citizens who have made such a fantastic contribution to our society, and British citizens across Europe, all facing uncertainty, jobs and industry at risk, the country in crisis. She needs now to show leadership. So can the Prime Minister tell us exactly what her plan is now? Yeah. The Prime Minister! Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, I continue to believe that the House today will have an opportunity to vote on no deal. They will then have an opportunity tomorrow, depending on how they voted tonight, to vote on the question of the extension of Article 50. And as I said last night, there will be hard choices for this House, but this House will need to determine uh, what its view is on the, uh, on the way forward. As far as the Government is concerned, we want to continue to work to leave the European Union. That is what we deliver for the people in the, uh, on the vote of the referendum. We will continue to work to deliver leaving of the European Union, but to deliver leaving the European Union with a good deal. And as regards the right honourable gentleman, he doesn't agree with government policy. He doesn't even agree with Labour Party policy. He has nothing to offer this country. Andrew Rosingdale. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the whole House will want to send its condolences to the families of the recent victims of knife crime, including the 17-year-old Jodie Chesney, who was tragically murdered in my borough of Havering. But when two-thirds of those carrying a knife escape custodial sentence, and when one in five repeat offenders avoid prison, what assurances will the Prime Minister give that we are serious about getting tough on knife crime, and does she understand why so many people are fed up with soft sentencing? Now, can I say to my honourable friend, first of all, that I am sure that members from across the whole House will want to join me in sending my deepest sympathies and condolences to the family and friends of Jodie. And I know there is nothing that we can do or say that is going to ease the pain of, that the family are going through at her, at, at her loss. Uh, can I say to my honourable friend that we are very clear that judges must have the powers they need to impose tough sentences on those involved in serious violence and knife crime. The law already provides for a mandatory prison sentence for a second offence of carrying a knife, and conviction of a knife or offensive weapon offence is now more likely to result in some form of custodial sentence and for longer than at any point in the last ten years. Obviously, individual sentencing decisions are a matter for the courts, but we are catching and prosecuting more people who carry a knife. Those who are convicted are now more likely to go to prison and for longer. But as I set out in Prime Minister's questions last week, both I and the Home Secretary are working to see what more we can do to deal with uh, the serious violence and the knife crime that has beset so many of our communities. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister of the tragedy in Ethiopia and the tragic loss of life? And of course, on this day, we commemorate the sad loss of the 16 young children and their school teacher in Dunblane that were cruelly cut down by Thomas Hamilton. And of course, that sanctity of young life is something that we remember today when we hear the news that the Honourable Member for Murray and his wife Crystal gave birth to a young son, and I'm sure the whole House will want to congratulate him. Mr. Speaker, a no deal will result in unprecedented harm. Does the Prime Minister really want to be the first Prime Minister in history to deliberately plunge the United Kingdom economy into recession? Yeah. Can I say to, first of all, can I say to the right honourable gentleman, I'm pleased to add my congratulations to my honourable friend, the uh, honourable member for Murray and his wife, on the birth of their son. Can I also say to the right honourable gentleman that I'm sure the thoughts of the whole house uh, uh, are with him in uh, uh, remembering the terrible, terrible events that took place in Dunblane and the terrible loss of young life that we saw uh, when that uh, when that happened. Um, and then can I finally say to the, the right honourable gentleman, he will of course hear the spring uh, statement from my right honourable friend, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, in, uh, a short, uh, in a short time. I'm pleased to say that will show the strength of the United Kingdom economy, the strength of the United Kingdom economy of which, of which Scotland is able to participate as a member of the UK. Ian Blackford. <laughs> Mr Speaker. In 16 days, the United Kingdom runs the risk of crashing out 
of the European Union with a no deal. And we know from the government's own analysis that that will crash the economy. Why doesn't the Prime Minister show some leadership today, do the right thing, and whip all her MPs to take no deal off the table on the 29th of March and forever? Prime Minister! You can only take no deal off the table by doing one of two things. Revoke Article 50. Revoke Article 50, which means betraying the vote of the referendum or agree a deal. If the Right Honourable Gentleman wants to take no deal off the table, he should have voted for the deal. Right word. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As our Honourable Friend, the Member for Romford, said, nearly a fifth of people convicted for a second or subsequent time of possessing an illegal knife are spared a prison sentence. We would not accept this for firearm offences. Will the Prime Minister look again at sentencing guidelines and sentencing practice to ensure that anyone carrying an offensive weapon gets the sentence they deserve? Can I, well, again, I say to my honourable friend that I fully appreciate the concern that he and our honourable friend, the member for Rossendale, and others across this house have shown on this issue. Um, the most recent statistics show that 82% of offenders received a custodial sentence for repeat possession offences. Um, obviously, as I said. Sentencing decisions are a matter for the courts, um, but we do, as a government, regularly look at ensuring that the powers are there to ensure that tough sentences can be imposed on those who are involved in knife crime. Rosie Duffield. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On Friday, some of the excellent head teachers in my constituency sent letters home with their pupils, detailing to parents how their budgets have been slashed by 8%, and they're struggling to make ends meet. They have asked on three. They have asked on three separate occasions since September 2018 for a meeting with the Secretary of State for Education to discuss school shortages in Kent and have been refused. So can the Prime Minister please ask him to meet with Ms Spinks, Ms Hind, Mr Wright, Mr Cooper, Ms Butcher, Ms Nope, Mr Pywell and others as a matter of urgency? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister! Well, I'm sure I will ensure that Ministers in the Department for Education have heard the request that the Honourable Lady has put forward. But just to remind her and members of this House, the school's budget this year is £42 billion. That is the highest school budget ever. Order! Order! The Honourable Member for Yardley is usually advocating good and respectful behaviour, which she must now herself exemplify, notwithstanding her passion or insistence upon her point of view, in which she is not exceptional. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The school's budget is the highest ever this year, and we have given every local authority more money for every pupil in every school this year. Mr Peter Bow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I think the whole House could unite um, in agreeing that the Prime Minister has put an enormous amount of hard work and energy yeah, yeah, yeah. in trying to resolve the European <coughs> Union yeah, issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we certainly wish her well and get better soon. Yeah. Has the Prime Minister had the opportunity to look at Amendment F on the order paper today, proposed by my right honourable friend um, from Ashford, the former Deputy Prime Minister, signed by many Conservative Remainer MPs and Conservative Labour MPs by the leader of the DUP and members of the Labour Party. I believe that, Mr Speaker, would unite the Conservative benches and would the Prime Minister and, and attract support from the opposition benches. Um, Prime Minister, have you had an opportunity to consider whether you would be able to support that amendment? Can I say Prime Minister! To my friend, and I'm grateful to uh, my right honourable and honourable friends for the spirit in which they have sought to broker compromise in this House. The amendment has four propositions within it. The first is that we should publish our day one tariff schedules. We have done so this morning. The second, that we should seek to extend the Article 50 process. We remain committed to giving the House the opportunity to debate and vote on this tomorrow. The third, that we should unilaterally guarantee the rights of EU citizens resident in the UK. I am pleased to reconfirm that we have done this. And the fourth is to seek to negotiate an implementation period in return for a financial payment, but without the withdrawal agreement that we have agreed. The EU have made it clear there will be no agreement without a withdrawal agreement, and that includes what we have already negotiated on citizens' rights, a financial settlement and a Northern Ireland protocol. 
Uh, the, the plan that exists, that has been agreed, is obviously the deal that was put to the House and rejected by the House uh, last night. But as I say, you have made clear that they would not uh, accept uh, elements of the uh, of uh, what is in the current withdrawal agreement without them being in a withdrawal agreement. Uh, Jay Platt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On Monday, it will mark 40 years since the Goldborn mining disaster in the constituency of Lee. It's a disaster which saw the tragic death of 10 miners, which still reverberates throughout our community and affects the families of those involved. Will the Prime Minister send her support for the commemoration service on Sunday and recommit in their honour to increase our work safety standards and provide all the support needed to our ex-mining communities? Yeah. Well, can I thank the Honourable Lady for raising this issue? I'm sure the whole House will uh, want to join me in sending my deepest sympathies and condolences to the families and friends of those who were affected by this terrible tragedy. I'm pleased to say that our health and safety record for mines has improved greatly since 1979. This, 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 improvement, this improvement has resulted from learning from previous incidents such as the Goldborn tragedy and to prevent as far as possible disasters like this. And as the Honourable Lady may know, in 2015, following an extensive review, the mines regulations replaced all previous legislation relating to health and safety in underground mines, um, and those provide a comprehensive and simple goal-setting legal framework to ensure mine operators provide the necessary protection for mine workers and others from the, what we all accept are inherent hazards in mines. But I can assure the Honourable Lady will continue to review safety regulations so we can make sure a tragedy like this never happens again. Shailish Barra. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Given that uh, no deal Brexit is the government's default position, will the Prime Minister kindly inform the House that she will instruct the Chancellor of the Exchequer to make available whatever funds are required to ensure that the country is as best prepared as possible in the event that we do leave on a no deal basis? I say to my right honourable friend, obviously we continue to be working to leave in an orderly fashion with a deal, but we have made uh, funding available. That funding is being used to ensure that we have preparations for a no deal. Bridget Phillipson. The Prime Minister routinely deflects questions on child poverty, insisting on absolute rather than relative measures. Can she assure the House that if the figures published later this month on her own preferred measure of absolute poverty showed that child poverty is rising, that she will at last join the one of those of us calling for a pause to universal credit? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Minister. I the Honourable Lady, I continue to believe, as I have said in this House before, uh, that the, the best route out of poverty is through work. I, what I, what I also, she refers to figures that I quote. I also do quote the figures, which I have to say I think are very important for this house of the number of children who, uh, the, the reduction in the number of children who are living in workless households. And all the evidence is, the evidence is, the evidence, and there is very clear evidence about how uh, the, the advantages of children being brought up in a house in which there is work. Universal credit is encouraging work. It is work. It is uh, delivering on ensuring that we see more people in work and able to provide for their families. Rachel McLean. Thank you, yeah, Mr yeah. Speaker. As a former technology entrepreneur, I have seen for myself the barriers that face aspiring women seeking to start up new businesses. Yeah, and yet yeah, we yeah. know that £250 billion could be added to the UK economy if women can start and scale up businesses at the same rate as men. So therefore, does the Prime Minister welcome Alison Rose's review into female entrepreneurship? And will she call today for the banks to adopt those recommendations without delay? Can I thank my honourable friend for raising this important issue and for bringing her own uh, successful experience in the, as an entrepreneur into this House? Uh, I'm very happy to join her in welcoming Alison Rose's review. Um, we are setting out our ambition to increase the number of female entrepreneurs by half by 2030. Um, we're doing that in various ways, including uh, my honourable friend, the business minister, will sponsor an industry-led task force alongside treasury ministers that is going to drive forward work to encourage greater investment in female entrepreneurs by all types of financial pro uh, finance providers, including the business. Yeah. Last year, 690 children 
children were attacked or threatened with a knife in the West Midlands. Parents are terrified. Police officers across the country agree that there's a link between the knife crime crime epidemic and the Prime Minister's decision as Home Secretary to cut 20,000 police officers yeah. from our streets. Is she the last person standing to deny that link? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, can I say to the Prime Lady, Minister, I last week some steps that the government is taking to um, increase the work we're doing in relation to knife crime. I understand my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, met with the Chief Constable of the West Midlands at the end of last week to discuss policing in the West Midlands. And can I say she refers to decisions that were taken by the government in 2010. Those decisions, yes, led to some difficult decisions in terms of public sector uh, funding, but they were taken because of the uh, appalling set of circumstances and the economy left by Labour. Or, order, order, uh, order. I understand that the honourable gentleman member for Bexhill and Battle is about to name check his mother, an admirable woman, a former teacher, and, in my view, very importantly, my constituent, Mr. Hugh Merriman. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think she loves you more than me these days. <laughs> because she's also a Labour supporter. Uh, okay, of course, you are independent. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, on behalf of me and my lovely mum, there are parts of the country, from Sheffield to Staffordshire to Sussex, where pupils are receiving less money per head than other parts of the country. I know the Prime Minister values a good education because she went to the same school as my mother, who became a teacher. So for me and my lovely mum, three things. More funding for our schools. Secondly, special educational needs. More focused priorities, stopping academies, excluding pupils unnecessarily for their targets. And thirdly, lowest funded areas funded first when we get this right. Thank you. Uh, can, I, can I thank my honourable friend for his question? Um, I, was, I was tempted to start off by saying that I suspect uh, he, I and his mother were at the school at a different time. Um, but I'm not. Oh, he says it's true. Good, because I wasn't. Um, in, in relation. I recognise that we have been asking schools to do more. We've responded with 1.3 billion extra of uh, extra investment going to our schools across this year and next. So the core schools budget will be rising by around 2.6 billion in total. And overall per pupil funding is being protected in real terms by this government. Every school. Every school is attracting at least 1% more per pupil by next year, and thousands of schools will attract significantly larger gains of up to 3% per pupil per year. This investment uh, will mean more children having the chance of a better future. But of course, what matters also is the quality of education that is provided. And I would commend my honourable friend's uh, mother, who I understand was a teacher, for the work that she did uh, has done in, uh, in education, and uh, say uh, the thanks from this whole house to all our teachers up and down the country for the work that they do. Lynn Brown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I told the Prime Minister a month ago, my constituent Marion was diagnosed with SMA1 in November of nine, uh, last year when she was just four months old. She needs Spinraza now and is likely only to live a few months without it. NICE met last week to discuss it, but cruelly, to date, haven't even announced a decision. Last time the Prime Minister told me to see a minister, I did, and nothing's changed. All I'm asking is for baby Mariam to have the same chance of spin rasa as she would if she lived in Scotland, Germany, Italy, Romania or 20 other European countries. Let me be clear. I'm asking the Prime Minister to intervene. Will she? Yeah. Prime Minister! The Honourable Lady, I'm sure everybody across the whole House obviously uh, is sending our, our sympathies and our concerns to the family of Mariam. We recognise this must be an incredibly difficult time. Decisions of this matter are rightly taken, not by politicians, but by clinicians. And the, the, uh, I understand the Honourable Lady recently met my right honourable friend, the Health Secretary. As she says, nice did look at the relevant information to this appraisal committee meeting on the 6th of March when it was considering uh, recommendations in relation to this, but it is right that the benefits and the evidence in relation to new medicines are properly considered by the experts in the field, by the clinicians. The Department for Health and Social Care is working with NICE on this issue. Andrew Griffiths. Uh, speaking, my constituent, uh, Nicola Morgan Dingley, is a wife and a mum. She was just 36 
when she was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer, the most virulent form. Sadly, at 38, Nicola has a terminal diagnosis. Um, she's asked me to ask three things today, Prime Minister. First of all, will you look at publicising the fact that women should never miss a mammogram uh, and how important it is that they attend? Secondly, will she consider lowering the age with which women are able to seek a mammogram so that more women aren't missed out? And thirdly, there are some immunotherapy trials taking place across the country which could potentially offer a lifeline to Nicola. Will she consider expanding those, uh, those trials so that Nicola can get the help that could save her life? Yeah. Yeah. The Prime Minister. Can I say to my honourable friend that obviously uh, I'm sure the whole House um, has, uh, shares his concern for his constituent Nicola and uh, our sympathies are with her and her family and friends. She asked about three things. Um, in relation to the age uh, at which the uh, a screening becomes available or is required, um, that is a matter that has been looked at previously, and I'm sure this is something that, the, uh, as we look forward to the long-term plan, um, will uh, be considered again. But I, my understanding is that it's, um, the decision is based on the evidence, again, about the benefits of these, uh, of these um, st uh, screenings at certain times. He referenced the immunotherapy. There are, the National Institute for Health Research has delivered 64 studies of immunotherapy for women with breast cancer to date. 28 studies are currently open to recruitment and 14 studies are currently in setup. Um, but I'll ask the Department for Health to respond to him about the specific case of his constituent. And finally, the third point that he raised from Nicola, absolutely right. I would urge all women to attend their mammogram appointments. They're vitally important. They could save your life. Stephen Hepburn. Does the Prime Minister not feel guilty that parents and teachers are forced to buy books and pens for schools and heads of cleaning classrooms? Yeah. Prime Minister. The Honourable Gentleman heard the response I gave earlier. We are putting more money into our schools. We're ensuring that overall per pupil funding is being, is being protected. Yes, we have, uh, we have been asking schools to do more and recognise the pressures that there are on schools, but the Government has responded with more funding. Mr David Ducat. No, the Honourable Gentleman. Uh, he had previously signalled an interest and I was trying to accommodate him, but never mind. Yes, very well. Mr David Trudinick. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, if my right honourable friend had been elected as leader of the Labour Party, would she be allowing a free vote this evening? <laughs> She's not responsible. Well, can I say to my honourable friend, I think that actually there are passionately held views on this issue and differences of opinion on this issue and I think it would be of benefit to the House if there was a free vote across the House. Oh, Mr Alistair Carmichael. Thank you Mr Speaker. On Sunday the community of Fay Isle in Shetland suffered a devastating blow when their world-renowned bird observatory was destroyed in a fire. The impact, Mr Speaker, of something like that on a community of 60 people is absolutely devastating, and they are still coming to terms with it. Will the Prime Minister join me in thanking those who have already supported Fair Isle, including the firefighters who tackled the blaze and those who transported them? And will she commit her government today to supporting the community in Fair Isle as they look towards rebuilding what is a globally important research resource so that it can get back into action as soon as possible? Yeah. Well, can I Minister, say, uh, gentlemen, uh, I would like to send my deepest sympathies to all those who work in and indeed who visit the observatory. And this will be devastating, as he says, for the local community. And I would like to offer my praise for the work of the fire and, uh, local fire and coast guard services for all their efforts in bringing the blaze under control. And I understand investigations are ongoing as to the cause of the fire. If the right honourable gentleman will um, uh, uh, allow me. It, this gives me an opportunity also to thank the firefighters who dealt with the fire in my own constituency of Maidenhead yesterday, which took place in Maidenhead Town Centre. Uh, now, I understand that the building he refers to is comprehensively insured. The owners are not seeking additional funding at this time, but I will ask a minister from the Scotland office to meet with the right honourable gentleman to see whether any further support can be provided. Mark Francois. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister, on the 29th of January, the House and virtually the entire Conservative Party, be they Brexiteer or Remainer alike, voted for the Brady Amendment with the strong encouragement of the Government, and Brady was designed to help facilitate the so-called 
Malthouse compromise. We do not yet have the Speaker's selection of amendments for the debate, but Prime Minister, if he is minded to select Amendment F, which is the Malthouse compromise, one, will it be a free vote? And two, how will you personally vote on it? I say to Prime Minister. He refers, I, I, answer, I referenced an answer to uh, an earlier question uh, the, from our uh, honourable friend the uh, elements of the Malthouse Amendment, uh, of the uh, amendment that is down that refers to one part of what was, became known as the Malthouse Compromise, and that, uh, as I referenced earlier, uh, some of those issues have already been addressed by the Government. But he refers to the Brady Amendment, the, the, the amendment put down in the name of my honourable friend, the Member for Altrincham and South West. That was about alternative arrangements replacing the backstop. Our honourable friend also indicated other ways in which the backstop, uh, concern about the backstop could, should be dealt with. Of course, what we have agreed in a legally binding character with the, uh, with the European Union is that commitment to ensuring that alternative arrangements are indeed uh, available by the end of December 2020, so that they can do what that amendment required and can replace the backstop. Mr. Williams. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Jody Whiting was a mother of nine from Thornaby who died by suicide in 2017. Just before her death, she missed a work capability assessment because of health problems and was sanctioned. The independent case examiner has found multiple and significant failings by the DWP, including five missed opportunities to identify that she had mental health problems and properly safeguard her. Her family are asking for an apology and to make sure that this can never happen again to anyone else. Can the Prime Minister offer this? Minister. I say to the Honourable Gentleman, he's absolutely right to raise this, um, this appalling case that took place, and our thoughts and sympathies are with Ms Whiting's family at this time. Um, as he said, what has been identified is that there were mistakes in handling her case, and it is absolutely right the Department has apologised for, their, fi for uh, their failings, and they are providing compensation to the family. That, of course, can never bring Ms Whiting back. Um, we obviously need the point he made is that we need to learn from this case, and that is why absolutely the department is looking at that case to make sure that we never see these sorts of uh, these sorts of uh, failings happening again and leading to such a tragic consequence. Pausey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Prime Minister has rightly made a priority to deliver more homes. So, will she welcome the great work of? Pro Growth Rugby Borough Council, which is currently providing new homes at over three times the UK average rate, with 739 last year and 860 alone underway, with four house builders at Halton. Prime Minister. Say to my honourable friend, I'm very happy to commend the uh, work of, uh, of his local council in providing more homes. I think it's very important. I'm also pleased that under this government, last year we saw more homes being built than in any. any, uh, any any year in the last 30 years, bar one. That is a record that we should be proud of, and obviously his council is very helpfully contributing to that, and I'm sure will continue to uh, support the real need to ensure that we have sufficient homes for, our, for families up and down this country. Martin Doherty Hughes. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You will know that uh, Western Berkshire has two notable anniversaries this week today the 78th anniversary of proportionally the worst aerial bombardment in the history of the United Kingdom, the Clybank Blitz. I'm sure the Prime Minister would wish to be the first ever British <laughs> Prime Minister to note it. And secondly, on Monday, my constituent Jagtar Singh Johal will have been incarcerated for 500 days without trial, will have suffered trial by media sanctioned, some would say, by the Indian state. And I do I appreciate that ministers are working very hard, but can the Prime Minister now say to their own Foreign Secretary, no guilt has been yet done, there has been no trial, why will they not meet with both myself, the constituency MP, and the family to hear what the impact of this incarceration is having on them? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Prime Minister. First of all, I recognise 
the uh, point that he made about the aerial bombardment that took place all those many years ago and the impact that that had on the local, co local community. Um, on the specific case, ministers are dealing with this. They have been actively, actively involved in this case. I will ensure, obviously, the Foreign Secretary has heard the request that he has, that he has put forward for a specific meeting. I believe one of the uh, ministers is actually dealing with this case and uh, will, I'm sure, be pleased to meet with him. Finally, Alberto Costa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the media have started calling this place a failing parliament. There was nothing failing about this place three weeks ago when we unanimously voted to protect the rights of citizens, British <coughs> and EU, and EU nationals here. Aside from the letter that the Secretary of State has written to Michelle Barney, can the Prime Minister update this House on what she has personally done? For example, she phoned Merkel and Macron or President Tusk to help protect British citizens in the EU and EU nationals here. Prime Minister. Yes, I'm happy to tell my honourable friend that I have spoken to a number of uh, EU leaders about the desire that we have for UK citizens in their countries to be fully protected were there a no deal and to be protected on a reciprocal basis. Some countries have already published legislation. We want to make sure that the basis on which they're providing uh, guarantees for UK citizens is on the same basis as we're providing guarantees for EU citizens here. Thank you. Order.